Hello everyone, my name is Carly Cottrell and today you're going to hear the real story of the Amityville Horror House. The shocking events in Amityville became a worldwide sensation that sparked a media frenzy. The story and events that took place there have spawned dozens of books and decades of films and documentaries. But the real story is so much more disturbing than anything you may have ever heard. Our story starts with the DeFeo family of Amityville, New York. We had Mr. DeFeo, Ronald Sr., Mrs. DeFeo, Louise, and then we had their children, the oldest being Ronnie Jr., otherwise known as Butch. Next in line was Dawn, who was 18, Allison, who was 13, Mark, who was 12, and John Matthew, who was only nine years old at the time of his death. The family was well known in the community and had lived in the home since 1965. They were active in the Catholic Church and from the outside this seemed like the picture perfect family. However, inside of the DeFeo home was a completely different story. Mr. DeFeo Ron Sr. was physically and mentally abusive to everyone else in the home and Mrs. DeFeo was commonly seen out with sunglasses, to cover up black eyes and long sleeve shirts to cover up the bruises on her body. The children in the home were regularly beaten and all of them expressed fear and hatred for their father. Ron DeFeo Jr. AKA Butch was a drug addict and an alcoholic. He would be high every day on heroin and cocaine and drink a fifth of scotch every day to escape the reality of his home life. Between all of that and the family's ties to organized crime and the mob in the area, things were really hanging on by a thread in the DeFeo home. That thread broke on November 13th, 1974, when Mr. and Mrs. DeFeo, the two sisters and the two youngest brothers were found brutally murdered inside of their Amityville home. The version you've probably heard before is that Ronnie DeFeo Jr. AKA Butch was motivated by voices in the home to kill his family, but, what if I told you that there was so much more than that? Ronnie DeFeo Jr.'s story has changed many, many times over the years. And depending on what interview you get or what mood you had seen him in, he would give you widely varying information. Instead of calling the police, calling 911, or even driving to a police station, Butch DeFeo decided to drive to a local bar that he frequented. He came, he opened the door and he was screaming, come on, help me, somebody shot my mother and father. And everyone ran out of the bar and that was it. They Did all took go? off. No, I had to stay, I was 10 anymore. They all jumped in his car and took off. People go, they end up calling the police, and he has a couple different stories from this point on. Story number one, he says, oh, I just found them like that, I have no idea what happened. Um, I don't know even what happened to the rest of the family. The second alibi that Ronnie Jr. tried to come up with was that the family's deaths were a mob rub out and that he came home to the carnage of his whole family being murdered by the mob and he was lucky he wasn't home or else he would have been killed too. And it was well known at the time that the DeFeo family did have direct contact and connection to organized crime in the area. However, the person that Ronnie gave up as the individual that he thought murdered his family had a really solid alibi, and so there was no way to connect that person to the crime. The third story that Ronnie brought to the attention of the police was that it was actually his sister, Dawn, that committed the murders, and that she was the only one that he killed, and it was out of a blind rage because he came home to her having murdered the entire family. Something that's not mentioned often and has only come up very recently in research is that Butch was actually married at the time. Even though he was only 23 years old, he was actually out of the home. He had a wife, her name was Geraldine, and they actually had a daughter together. It's reported that the mother, Mrs. DeFeo, called Butch and said that Dawn and her father were in a big fight and she wanted him to come home to try to like ease things between the two of them. The story goes that that is the reason that Butch was actually at the DeFeo home that evening instead of with his family. After the rest of the patrons follow Ronnie back to the house, they go in and search and find out that yes, all of the members of the DeFeo household had been shot and murdered in their sleep. 
The police were called and one by one, they started bringing out the bodies of the members of the DeFeo family. Let's start talking about the crime scene. Mr. and Mrs. DeFeo were both found in bed, face down, two gunshots in each of them. And all of the children were each shot one time. Now here's the thing. The family was killed with 35 caliber Marlin 336C rifle. That's a rifle powerful enough to be heard from five blocks away, but guess who reported hearing even a single shot? No one, not a single neighbor heard it, which is crazy because even one shot should have alerted not just every other person in the house, but the entire neighborhood as well. So why didn't anyone hear the shot or any of the shots or report anything to the police? And this is a quiet neighborhood. This is not a neighborhood where you're just like hearing car backfires and gunshots and stuff. This is a very quiet, like sleepy town. Evidence also supported the fact that Mrs. DeFeo and Allison were both awake at the time of their murders. The boys, John and Mark, were both found face down murdered in their beds. An interesting point, however, was that Mark, 12 at the time, was actually in a wheelchair due to a football injury and was only supposed to be sleeping on his back, chest up. So it made zero sense for him to be supposedly sleeping face down, which started to get people wondering, was he forced to lay down? Was he forced to turn over? Maybe not looking at his attacker, or maybe the attacker didn't want to look him in the face when he shot him. Mrs. DeFeo was said to have direct ties with the mob through her father, Michael Brigante, and he actually paid for Butch's legal defense for a certain amount of time. After seeing the scene and obviously seeing that Butch was the only surviving member of the family left, he was taken into custody for immediate suspicion. His alibi started to fall apart after obviously them asking like, hey, when you found your family was dead, why didn't you just go to the neighbors and call the police instead of driving to your favorite bar where you knew everyone? Kind of sus, right? And then after him trying to blame it on a low level informant saying it was a mob rub out, them finding out that that exact person actually had an alibi, they were just really seeing that the whole story was starting to fall apart. Then, Ron Jr. tells his real story. He says, no, uh, actually it was my sister Dawn and I can prove it. So Butch, Ronnie Jr. says that Dawn was fed up of being abused. She just wanted to move out to be with her boyfriend, but her family wouldn't let her. And she was desperate to leave the abusive situation of her family life. It said that Dawn was so desperate to leave her family that she actually staged her own kidnapping. A ransom note was sent to her grandfather, Mr. Briganti, and he sent Herman Race to go and get her back. After a confrontation with the two men that supposedly had her, it was revealed that she actually tried to scam him for $5,000. Which said that after the last fight with her father, she was done with it. And it's also said that she was also an addict, just like her brother. Supposedly, the two of them went down into the basement and got high the night that Butch came to stay with his family. Now at this point, he claims that everyone went to bed and he was kind of like falling asleep, dozing in and out, watching a war movie on TV. Then Butch claims, that in the night he heard voices, supposedly the voices of his family like conspiring and plotting against him. Then he sees a dark shadowy figure with black hands hand him a rifle while he's seated. This entity, person, whatever, tells him to kill the family to protect himself. But in other stories, he says it was actually his sister Dawn that asked him to kill his parents for them. So could it be that this dark figure with black hands was actually Dawn while he was high and couldn't tell the difference or was imagining or conflating this dark figure? What if Dawn just had gloves on and handed him a rifle while they were both high after she had begged him to kill their parents? A neighbor even recalls seeing Dawn leave the home and being outside of the home with a coat on and long dark gloves come on come on so she goes back inside ronnie's all high they've all had this conversation about killing their parents and then 
what if she just with those gloves on not trying to get dirty right she has a coat on because she doesn't want any evidence on her hands him the rifle and pretends to be this voice or he sees it as this voice this entity saying kill your parents ronnie protect everybody after the whole oh the house told me to do it i didn't know what i was doing there were voices thing didn't really like take with uh, authorities then he was just like nope it was my sister she did it she told me to do it in fact i didn't even want to do it and then she told me to shoot our parents and then i got her a gun i brought her a rifle and i showed her how to use it like he was like oh this isn't my fault but i br i brought her a gun that i had and then i showed her how to use it and then i brought her to our parents room and then but like she she shot them and then i was super shocked i was like oh my god what did you do no yes. so then he claims okay left the house and his story again his story changes a couple times here as well so in some interviews he says oh i left and i drove for a long time i had the radio on and i just thought and thought to myself oh my gosh i don't know but he says he also told her there's some things i need to do there's some things that need to get done just don't touch anything and i'll be back so obviously he knew he understood what happened he had like a conscious understanding that his parents had been killed and that he suddenly was like, okay, I need to fix it or there's some steps I need to take before whatever this final action he said he was gonna do. Some of his stories he says he drove silently with no radio. Some of the stories he says, oh, I drove and I remember the exact time that the person on the radio said it was 3.02 a.m. when I was you know, in this certain part of town in New York. So then he comes back to the house. He comes back to the house after an undetermined amount of time and then supposedly finds his family killed. But here's the deal. He says, oh, I drove through the night. I had no idea what happened. And then I went back and I found them. But when he went back was like way later. He didn't go into the bar to tell people that his family had been killed until in the evening. Okay, so if his family was murdered <laughs> in the early morning of November 13th, then he waited until like later in the evening that day. So then there's reports that he actually saw everything happen, then went somewhere and got high, then went to work and then then went to the bar so maybe he was trying to establish an alibi a time frame i don't know after this long mystery drive he says that he came back to the house to talk to don and figure out what to do about their murdered parents so then he comes in and is shocked to find out that don has murdered the entire rest of the family butch says reportedly that he asked him like why did you do this why did you kill the rest of them? And that Dawn replied that she was jealous of Allison for some reason. I guess Allison was growing up to be a very beautiful young lady and supposedly there was jealousy with the younger sibling. I don't know if this has any validity or merit, but according to Butch, Ronnie Jr., the excuse that Dawn gave for murdering her younger sister was that there was just jealousy and she needed to go. According to Butch, Dawn claims that she killed the boys because they heard the gunshots and the neighbors heard the gunshots. However, none of the neighbors reported ever hearing gunshots that night. Ronnie DeFeo Jr. then gets into a physical altercation with Dawn, reportedly wrestling the gun from her, pushing her onto the bed, and then shooting her in the face at close range in blind rage over the loss of his family. Okay, so you're thinking like, wow, what a crazy story. That's, that's probably it, right? That's it, right? <laughs> No, that's not even that's not even that that's not even it for that night. It's not even it's not even it for that part of the story. Investigators start looking into that aspect of the story. Like Okay Ronnie, so if it wasn't like demonic voices in your head and it was actually your sister, your teenage sister. How did all of the people stay in their beds and no one heard the shots? 
If only one person did it, even if it was Don, if it was Don or if it was Ronnie, if one person did it and there was one gunshot, how did no one else in the house wake up? No one woke up? Little kids? Little kids hear anything? They're up. They're up. They're trying to like go into their parents' rooms. They want to know what's going on. Little kids wake up at anything, right? So you're going to tell, you're going to tell me that after four gunshots of a rifle, a 35 caliber rifle, a Marlin 336C, that not only did the neighbors not hear anything, but no one in the house heard anything either? None of the kids woke up with that? This is fish, okay? Sus. In one of the interviews, Ronnie DeFeo Jr. says that he drugged his family so that they wouldn't wake up. But in all the toxicology reports that were done, it said that they not only tested the bodies, but all of the major organs and found no drugs or any outside substances in any of the bodies. Ronnie DeFeo Jr. also says that he had to fight Dawn for the gun after finding out that she had killed their entire family and that wrestling the gun away from her and pushing her down onto the bed would explain the bruises on her body. However, Deputy Medical Examiner Howard Adelman reported, quote, she had no contusions or abrasions on her that were fresh that might indicate a struggle of some sort." End quote. He also stated that there was no evidence of contact or physical altercation, i.e. a fight. He also spoke of the law of mutual exchange, which basically states that if there is contact, pieces of one will go on to pieces of the other. So for example, if Don and her brother were to have gotten into a fight, then there would have been physical fiber or DNA evidence of one on the other. So the fact that there was no evidence of either was not very supporting of Butch's claim. It's also said that the nightwear she had on was in no way in disorder or disarray. There was no ripping, there was no scuffing or wrinkling. So there was really nothing to suggest that there was any sort of altercation between Dawn and anyone else that night. Even though there was no physical fiber or DNA evidence and that her dressing gown, nothing was out of order, nothing was torn, there was unburnt gunpowder residue on the outside of her pajamas. The unburned gunpowder found on Dawn's night clothes was still uh, not really setting well with investigators. Why was the powder on the front of her nightgown when she was found face down in her bed dead? The family's supposed ties to mafia involvement come back into play at this time. Ronnie DeFeo Jr.'s grandfather was footing the bill for his legal defense. And after Ronnie DeFeo Jr. had been saying, oh, it was Dawn, it was this, it was that, his grandfather just said, stop dragging our family name through the mud, admit to what you did, and let's just deal with this. So then the next day, Butch, Ronnie DeFeo Jr., did admit to the slaying of the entire DeFeo family. His confession said that once he started, he just couldn't stop and it went so fast. These are the words that Butch Ronnie DeFeo Jr. gave to police as to how and why he killed the entire DeFeo family. Okay, so you know how earlier it was getting interesting? Buckle in, you guys, because it's about to get extra interesting. Okay, so now he's like said, oh, this is what happened. You know, I just snapped, I just killed everyone. It just went so fast, I don't even know, right? So now he says, I killed everyone. Then I went, I dumped the gun in the river, and then I went and I disposed of everything else in a drain. Butch claims that after the murders, he got the rifle and he dumped it off on the side of the water at the end of the boathouse. Then, he left, he went to a girlfriend's house. Yes, a girlfriend. I know we talked about him being married earlier. Crazy times. So he went to the girlfriend's house, then got nice and high. Cause you know, remember the drug addict part? So drug addict part, then went to work. Just another day at work, right? So, you know, 
Let's think morning routine, uh, get up nice and early, 3.15, murder my family, um, cover up the murder, uh, destroy the evidence, go see my secret lover, get nice and high, uh, go to work, you know, the usual. Then after work, goes to his favorite bar, just drives on over to Henry's, normal day. <laughs> Long day at work, am I right? And then just claims, oh, also, cause I, I, uh, my family's dead, my whole family's dead. Check it out with me if you want, down the street. <laughs> We've talked about him changing his story a fair amount. One of the interviews that he did, he claims to have tricked coroners and tricked crime scene investigators by changing the temperature in the home before he left after committing the murders. He says that he raised the temperature in the home, turning up the thermostat, knowing that it would trick them into thinking the time of death was actually different than it really was. Ronnie DeFeo Jr. was brought to trial on October 14th, 1975. And during this trial, they went over all of the explanations that he gave, the finding them without any reason, then the mob rub out, then the whole thing with his sister, and then came another theory. Are you ready to level up on the weirdness scale? Well, let's do this. The second bullet that was removed from Mrs. DeFeo's body didn't match the rifle that Butch supposedly used to kill the entire family, which means there was another weapon used in the murder of the DeFeo family. Ronnie DeFeo Jr. did give up the location for a group of evidence that he had dumped in Brooklyn. He basically took a bunch of uh, shell casings, he took also the, the big zip up case and all, also a holster for a handgun. Why? Dumped it all in a drain. The other stuff, obviously you want to get rid of, but like, why would you dump a holster for a handgun in a drain with all the other stuff that was used in murder if the handgun was not used in murder? People start to think, okay, maybe there was another shooter. Maybe there was another weapon. So documentary filmmaker Ryan Katzenbach was like, listen, I think there is another weapon and I'm gonna prove it. Not only did he think, I am pretty sure that I know there was another weapon, but I also think I know exactly where it went. He's gonna look at the same place where the first weapon was probably disposed of. So. He goes to the end of the dock, into the water, the same place where he thinks the rifle went, and he says, I'm gonna hire a diving team and I'm gonna send them down there until they find that handgun. And yes, in 2012, they did actually find in the same area where the initial rifle was dumped, they did find a piece of what looks very strikingly like a piece of a handgun. They did turn it over to Suffolk County Police for investigation. There were a lot of people that supported the multiple shooter theory, the accomplice theory, uh, for a number of different reasons. Number one, why didn't anyone else in the family move or try to leave the room? Number two, why were they all found face down, despite, like we said earlier, one of the sons having an injury so bad that he was in a wheelchair and supposed to only sleep face up? Also evidence that suggests that some of the family members may have been killed elsewhere and then placed back in their beds, let alone this whole like other weapon theory. There's just too many pieces here. We're officially into the Ronnie DeFeo Jr. trial. I'm gonna read you a tiny little excerpt from uh, AmityvilleMurders.com. This gives you an idea of how the trials began for Ronnie DeFeo, AKA Butch. So on January 15th, 1975, Butch's then lawyer, Jacob Siegfried, motioned the court to be permitted, quote, the right to examine, inspect, copy, photograph, or make and take photostatic copies of the original notes of the arresting officers together with the police reports containing statements of the witnesses, end quote. 
Siegfried insisted these items were crucial to his affidavit, saying the defendant was deprived of his right to a preliminary hearing in the district court by the district attorney's actions in presenting the case directly to the grand jury. Regardless, the court did not believe these items were necessary for Butch's defense, and on March 11, 1975, presiding judge John Jones denied the request. With little choice remaining, Siegfried later filed a notice of defense of mental disease or defect for his client. Since the defense had been denied an equal opportunity to have the same reports, records, and photos that the prosecution had in its possession, there was only one choice left, an insanity plea. <sighs> Butch didn't really like this, and he didn't like his sanity being questioned. That made him angry. So finding this out, he evidently claimed to strangle his attorney, which if you're trying to prove your sanity in a murder case, maybe like threatening to strangle your attorney, like not like your strongest bet. <laughs> Michael Brigante Sr., Butch DeFeo's grandfather at this point had spent more than $40,000 on legal fees and said, quote, sweetheart, your dimes played out. It's time for another level up, everybody. So I've been mentioning a couple times, oh, it just gets weirder and weirder. This is another one of those points where it just gets weirder. On July 7th, 1975, William Weber is appointed to defend Ronald DeFeo Jr. William Weber fought hard for an adjournment. He said that there's just too much speculative evidence. There could have been other people. We don't even know what the weapons were. Like, we just don't know. It wasn't him. You can't prove it, right? Despite all of that, they did decide to go ahead with jury selection in October of 1975. William Weber felt that it was clear that Ronald DeFeo Jr. was not being afforded the same luxuries of the American defense system and asked his client to really lean into that whole insanity defense thing, which meant specifically talking about the voices that he heard inside the home that dictated him to kill his family. Even though Butch DeFeo did not want to, it was getting to the point where a defense was needed and so the insanity plea was brought back into play even with his new defense and even though they really needed him to, to, to be crazy just get extra crazy unfortunately Ronnie DeFeo Jr. wasn't really the best actor and got himself kind of tied up and contradicted himself pretty early on in with trying to use the insanity defense as a way out of what he did. From here on out, it gets even more frustrating and even sadder, if you can even imagine, because we've all done that like murder of a family thing, but now we get into media manipulation. Oh yeah. So William Weber is, um, is a bit of a character, I'm not gonna lie. William Weber has been documented saying during the trial that they could get him these deals, but he has to say there were voices, but that after he serves the couple of years from his insanity plea, he'll have plenty of money from his story. This is the beginning of the Amityville Horror House hoax. How do we know this? Because in a notarized affidavit, Geraldine, remember Ronnie DeFeo Jr.'s wife? In a signed affidavit, she says that she was party to the knowledge and the specific details of Ronnie DeFeo Jr. being offered a deal for monetary compensation from him going through with the insanity plea, claiming that there were voices in possession in the home and that that's why he killed his family. It is debated on whether or not Geraldine and Butch were married during the time of the murders. They did marry while he was in prison, but people speculate that maybe they weren't married during the time of the murders and that the children she had were from another man. She claims that they were married and all of the evidence to that was erased by the mob to protect her. Evidently a book deal is enough for your lawyer to tell you to claim insanity and also pretend like your house was haunted and that's why your entire family was murdered. On November 21st, 1975, a judge found Ronald DeFeo Jr. guilty of six counts of second degree murder. On December 4th, 1975, a judge sentenced Ronald DeFeo Jr. to six sentences of 25 years to life. 
Ronald Butch DeFeo Jr. died on March 21st, 2021 at 69 years of age, still serving the sentences for the murders taken place in Amityville. There are so many other mysteries with this case, so many other points, and so much more to tell. The next part of this series is going to be part two about the Lutz family and the Amityville haunting. Thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate each of you, and as always, I'll see you next time.